live from New York City. It's The Cube at Wikibon Big Data Capital Markets Day 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor, WAN Disco, with support from EMC, MarkLogic, and Teradata. Now, here is your host, Dave Vellante. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for attending the Wikibon Capital Markets event. My name is Dave Vellante. I know many of you, and uh, appreciate you guys coming here today, uh, especially since 42nd Street is closed. You guys know the story that are here, so uh, thanks for finding your way in. When we had the notion of this event, of course, we're running this in conjunction with Hadoop World and Strata. We had the idea of some of the research that we've been doing at, at Wikibon, and uh, Trying to understand investment angles on big data. There are really only a few big data companies that are pure plays. Splunk, Tableau, Click, and really they're sort of on the periphery of big data. And so we thought that we could maybe share with you some of our research and talk about the market and maybe come up with some investment angles. We first heard a couple years ago, Jeff and I were at Atlas Ventures and Peter Goldmacher, who's in the audience and on the panel today, put forth the premise that big data practitioners are actually going to create more value than, 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 you know, than vendors, suppliers. So we started researching that. And what we've seen observed, uh, observed over the past several years is, is this so-called, what some people are calling a digital fabric emerging. What's the digital fabric? Well, historically, if you look at industries, whether it's retail or manufacturing or healthcare or media, their, 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 their stack, if you will, was very highly vertically integrated design, production, manufacturing, and it was pretty hardened. What we're seeing now is these sort of horizontal layers emerging across those industries, infrastructure as a service, some people call it cloud, transaction applications, social applications, and of course, big data. And it seems to us that the organizations that are able to ride on top of that and produce value, I mean, the obvious ones are Google and Amazon and Facebook, but Jeff Kelly's gonna talk about some others. So our, our session here today is really we're going to talk about what's happening in the enterprise market generally and specifically the enterprise software market in the big data space. And we're going to drill into to big data and then really try to introduce this notion of what's happening in the practitioner world and try to come up with some investment angles uh, for, the, for the Wall Street folks in the room to really how do you play this, this market. So Jeff Kelly's going to give a presentation and then we've got a panel, we've got a great panel. Amy O'Connor is here. She's with Cloudera, former big data practitioner at Nokia. Uh, the aforementioned Peter Goldmacher is also in the audience, former Cowan analyst. And Avi Mehta, who was a CUBE guest earlier today, uh, former practitioner at uh, B of A and now CEO of a company called Traseda. And then Jeff Kelly. We're going to riff on some of these trends. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce Jeff Kelly, Wikibon's big data analyst. Jeff? for coming. Uh, we're really excited about today. We've been planning for this for a while and we've got some great new research we want to share with you. Um, and so, you know, want to talk about uh, a little bit about, you know, my background. Dave talked a little bit about Wikibon. Uh, I've been covering this market with Wikibon now for about four years, covering the big data space. Prior to that, I was uh, with Tech Target as a journalist covering the more traditional BI data warehouse world for about seven years. So I've got over a decade uh, of experience covering uh, this market. Um, you know, at Wikibon, we talk to, collaborate with big data practitioners, hundreds of them, through research, through the cube, through other, through other means. Um, and everything we're going to share with you today, all the insights are derived from our conversations, our research, our collaboration with big data practitioners and members of the Wikibon community. So I thought maybe to get started, just to kind of lay the groundwork. So my presentation today is going to be broken down into three parts. Um, the first part, we're going to take a look at kind of the traditional data management market, where that stands today, uh, what some of the pressures they might be feeling, um, and what practitioners think about that market today. Second, we're going to talk about the big data market, the emerging big data ecosystem. That includes the technologies, the vendors at play, and some of the dynamics that are happening there. And finally, we're going to put together, as Dave mentioned, uh, we're going to put forth an investment thesis, uh, how investors who are looking at this market, trying to figure out where to place their bets, kind of give them a framework to try to understand uh, where, to, where to put their bets to make some money in the big data market. So now it's obvious to anybody here, you, know, you, you watch CNBC, you read the journal, New York Times, and it's obvious 
that industry heavyweights are under pressure. There's no question about that. Oracle, missing earnings and revenue quarter after quarter. Uh, Teradata has lost over $3 billion in market cap since last year. On their last call, their CFO said they expect to come in on the low end of guidance for the next quarter. Uh, SAP, you know, all we hear about from SAP is HANA, and they're trying to figure out how that fits into this new landscape. Uh, they're also struggling a little bit with where the cloud fits in that equation. So these guys are under pressure. There's no question about that. And then meanwhile, at the same time, we've got this big data ecosystem that is just exploding. So if you've been down to the Javits today, or if you get a chance to head down there tomorrow, you go to the show floor, you'll see uh, just an explosion of vendors in this space who are really creating um, you know, the new innovative approaches to data management and analytics. Um, you know, very different approaches than what we've seen in the more traditional space. So now, the question is, is there a cause and effect relationship between the two? Um, the struggles of some of the industry heavyweights, the pressure they're feeling, is that because of the emergence of big data and the Hadoop ecosystem? You know, in my opinion, the answer to that question is yes. So we talked to, as I mentioned, hundreds of practitioners in this space, um, and these, this is one of the core research areas that we're focused on, and what we hear over and over again from practitioners is that you know, they are increasingly baselining their spend on a traditional EDW. Their challenge with storage costs, you know, data volumes are going up, but budgets are staying flat. So we're increasingly seeing them baselining EDW spend and carving off a portion of what they would spend on the EDW, moving that to the big data Hadoop space where they're experimenting, trying to get this thing figured out because as we'll talk about a little later, big data for all its promise is still very challenging. There's no question about that. So as part of my presentation, I wanted to share with you some feedback that we've gotten from the Wikibon community. <coughs> Specifically, we've talked to practitioners about this relationship between the enterprise data warehouse and big data. And this is just a snippet of findings from these conversations. And these are actual quotes from practitioners we've talked to. And this is from a financial services professional. Quote, we're chasing the ch chips we struggle to get maximum performance from a complex, highly concurrent operational data warehouse environment where hundreds, sometimes thousands of users are interacting without constraint on the system 24-7. Another one, another financial services professional. I've been at Company X 22 years, and this data warehouse for the entire time I've been here has been the snake swallowing the basketball. We're just getting a huge amount of data here through the pipeline. It's always been a challenge. We get it solved and then we go from fractions to decimals and the data explodes by 10 times. Now they're going to throw pennies at us and data is going to explode again. And this isn't just a 10, 20, 30 percent data growth year over year. There are these data tsunamis where all of a sudden my data grows by 10 times. You solve it and then it explodes on you again. And one last one I wanted to share is from an insurance professional. We are definitely looking at moving more and more of our analytic and reporting workloads to Hadoop from our data warehouse. There are a lot of factors at play, but cost is definitely one of them. When you're looking at proprietary hardware and software of a data warehouse vendor versus commodity hardware and open source software, it's quite a difference. I think there will be a role for the data warehouse, but I don't know what it is. I definitely don't see it getting any bigger. And we've got dozens more of these. And we've had similar conversations with quite a few practitioners. And so I, I think it's fair to say, and in my opinion, in the opinion of the Wikibon community, that the enterprise warehouse, data warehouse, has not lived up to its promise. Now, as I mentioned, I've been covering this market for over a decade. And during that time, I've heard a number of promises from the data warehouse, BI, data integration vendors. Four in particular that seem to come up over and over again, and that is the promise of a 360 deg degree view of the customer, a single version of the truth, ubiquitous business intelligence capabilities for business users, not just analysts and data scientists, and the most important, I think, real-time actionable intelligence. I think based on our conversations with practitioners and our coverage of the market over that time, I think it's fair to say that the enterprise data warehouse has not lived up to those promises. Now, to be fair, it certainly has delivered value, I think particularly in the compliance side of the house. And certainly, you know, the data warehouse has provided a level of insight that wasn't available before. But largely, I don't think the data warehouse has lived up to those promises. Now, kind of moving into the second part, of our presentation today, the next question, of course, is will big data live up to the hype? So what you're looking at here is Wikibon's big data market forecast. This represents revenue from both hardware, software, and services. 
uh, as you can see, we've pegged the big data market in 2014 to top $28 billion, growing to $50 billion in 2017. Now, this is made up, as I mentioned, hardware, software, services. The biggest component here is services. So uh, that's really not surprising if you think about, as I mentioned, big data is still hard. The technology is still complex. Uh, and services plays a role of helping put all that together. That's about 45% of the market. Um, the next largest component is the hardware component. Again, when you've got a fundamentally a scale-out approach on commodity boxes, commodity hardware, that, that takes a lot of hardware, especially, especially as you're scaling, uh, adding more data volumes. Hardware plays a big role, and that's about 35% of the revenue. And software is actually the smallest component, just about 20% of overall revenue. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment, but you know, part of the reason, of course, is in the big data space, a lot of the software is open source, which means it's free to download. And especially when you're at this stage in the market where you've got a lot of experimenting going on, POCs, and again, we'll share some data around that, um, a lot of practitioners are first starting with free open source software. So how does this translate into market leaders? Well, when you've got a market that's very heavy on services and hardware, it might not be surprising that today the leaders, in terms of revenue in big data, are IBM, HP, and Dell. Now, IBM obviously has got a huge services arm. Uh, they made a lot of investments in analytic software, uh, and they are at the forefront in terms of the larger vendors in pushing this notion of big data and analytics to their customers. HP and Dell are coming at it more from the hardware side of the equation. Now, I can see my friend Albi Mehta out there kind of rolling his eyes a little bit. IBM is big data, HP, Dell, this is, not, uh, this is not what we expected, right? So for you purists out there, let's talk about, quote unquote, real big data. What's really happening in this part of the market? So what you're seeing here is Wikibon Hadoop NoSQL market forecasts. Now it's important to note this is a subsegment of the larger forecast that we just shared with you. So of the uh, total $50 billion market we think that's gonna happen by 2017, a little over three billion of that, between three billion and four billion is going to be uh, generated through Hadoop and NoSQL software. Now, granted, this is a small slice of the larger market, but I think what's important to remember here is that Hadoop and NoSQL are two of the foundational technologies in what Dave described as the di digital fabric, along with uh, infrastructure as a service, social, and some other things. Uh, so this is a critical component of the big data market, and really this is where a lot of the innovation, pretty much all of the innovation is coming from, um, is in this open source Hadoop and NoSQL space. So, you know, we've taken a look at the, the larger market. We're taking a look here at the Hadoop NoSQL space. So as investors, you know, what are investors thinking? Where do I want to put my money? You know, who are the big data pure plays out there? And Dave mentioned earlier, um, on the public markets, there aren't too many options out there. And I think it's even a little bit of a stretch to call these players pure plays. I'd say the closest to a public big data pure play is probably Splunk. Uh, we were just at Splunk's conference, third, third one in a row uh, that we've attended, Splunk Conference 2014. Now the knock on Splunk is that they are a little bit expensive and that they're gonna have challenges scaling. Um, but the reality is their customers are enthused. Uh, they're solving problems and Splunk is really delivering value for them. Splunk is actually one of the few uh, what I would call big data application companies out there focused on machine generated data. Next we've got Tableau and again this is a little bit more on the periphery again as Dave mentioned uh, focused on data visualization and they're really disrupting the traditional business intelligence market so the whole idea behind Tableau is to deliver self-service data vis visualization to business users, to end users, you know, the non-analysts out there. Um, again their challenge, you know, they were kind of created pre-mobile, pre-cloud revolution. So for them, the challenge is adapt into this new world and they're, they're taking steps to do that. Uh, Click, similar value proposition, a business intelligence uh, data visualization company really focused on self-service, disrupting that kind of traditional market. Uh, they are, you know, have a heavy presence in Europe. One of their challenges is gonna be breaking into the US market. But of course, what everybody really wants to know about is when are the Hadoop pure plays going to go public? So with all due respect to my friends out there who uh, may be in the, in the room here or, or watching from IBM and Pivotal, we really think there's only three Hadoop distributions that matter. Cloudera, MapR, and Hortonworks. Now Cloudera, Cloudera uh, has uh, you know, started in 2009. They were the first to, to market. 
Um, and they have raised quite a bit of money. All three have raised quite a bit of money, but Cloudera in particular uh, raised nearly a billion dollars, uh, about three quarters of that from an investment by Intel, which now owns an 18% stake in the company. So in terms of going to public market, uh, I think that move, which happened in the spring, probably pushes that off a ways for Cloudera. Uh, in terms of revenue, we've uh, estimated Cloudera's revenue, and let me just say we don't have any inside information. We uh, do our revenue estimations best based on you know, publicly available data, conversations with vendors, with their customers, uh, taking into account metrics like headcount, things like that. So uh, having said that, our estimate for Cloudera coming into, or, or as we come up on the end of 2014, uh, is just north of 100 million in revenue this, this year. Next, Mapbar, Hortonworks, I think those two vendors are more likely uh, to go public in the shorter term. Um, Mapbar, we have coming in just north of 60 million in revenue. Hortonworks, we're estimating just south of 100, somewhere between 90 and 95 million this year in revenue. We'll talk a little bit more about these players in a moment. Um, the NoSQL space, it's a little different. There are not three vendors, two vendors that dominate. There's any number uh, of vendors out there in NoSQL space. It's a little bit more of a splintered market. There are you know, dozens of NoSQL databases and vendors trying to commercialize them. Identifying three here who are leading the market, um, in, at least in terms of revenue. MarkLogic, uh, we're estimating coming in somewhere north of 80 million in revenue this year. MongoDB, extremely popular with developers. Um, the open source model, the company itself, we're looking at slightly over 50 million in revenue this year. And finally, DataStax, uh, which is commercializing uh, Apache Cassandra, data, uh, NoSQL database uh, that's created at Facebook. Uh, coming in somewhere north of 40 million. So, you know, we've talked about the size of the Hadoop market, the NoSQL market, we've talked about some of the players out there, um, and I think there's an interesting dynamic happening in both the Hadoop and NoSQL spaces. I use Hadoop to kind of illustrate it, but it's, it's happening in both markets, and, and that is practitioners are asking themselves the question about Hadoop is to pay or not to pay. So, one of the interesting dynamics with uh, the new big data movement is much of the software, as I mentioned, is open source. So. What you're looking at here are some findings from our recent uh, adoption, big data adoption survey we uh, conducted at Wikibon with Wikibon Big Data Practitioners. And this was focused on early adopters, so these are people who are at the very least in the evaluation stage uh, of big data. Now these circles, these empty circles, these zeros here represent the 51% of practitioners that told us they're using uh, Roll Your Own Apache Hadoop. So they're not paying anything for that, they're, they've downloaded the software from Apache Hadoop and are experimenting with that. Now the Tanish colored uh, circles on the far right there uh, represent the 24% of practitioners in our survey who said they are using one of the free distributions from one of the vendors, whether it's Cloudera CDH, uh, Hortonworks HDP, or uh, MapRs M3. Now these dollar signs, which I think would probably interest the vendors, represent the 25%, just the 25% that are actually paying subscri subscription customers of one or more of the Hadoop distribution vendors. So you know, if you're one of these vendors, or perhaps an investor thinking about investing in, in these companies as they do come to market, um, you know, you can look at this as you know, a glass half full, glass half empty. I'd say, well, it's a quarter full anyway. Um, but it's an interesting dynamic and one that has to be taken into consideration uh, when you're looking at this market. And then, of course, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, the, the ecosystem is just exploding and makes things just that much more difficult for investors to kind of squint through. And the reality is the big data market is just the Wild West right now. Um, now this slide represents you know, quite a few companies. I probably could have filled up three more slides with uh, the different startups in this space. And uh, as Dave and I were traveling here to New York, we were talking to each other about this, uh, this market. And we're trying to think of a technology company that's not in the big data space in one way or another. And we really couldn't think of one. Um, really, pretty much every major technology company has a play here. Um, and everybody's trying to get their piece. Um, you know, this does make it difficult to kind of squint through all this noise, and it's important, I think, to kind of boil it down to two you know, really basic but important questions uh, that we consistently get from the Wikibon community in one form or another. And of course, important for investors, and that is, will anybody make any money in open source big data? Put another way, will there be a red hat of Hadoop? It's another you know, question you hear a lot out in the media. And really, if you want to boil it down, bottom line is, will there ever be a billion dollar big data software company? And the second question we get is, will Oracle, SAP, Teradata, all the industry heavyweights, are they going to swallow up a lot of these big data startups that we're seeing in the ecosystem? So you know, on question one, 
you know, my opinion is yes. There will be money to be made in open source big data. And I do think there will be a billion dollar big data software company. Now, if I had to place my bets, I'd say right now the most likely candidates for that are either Cloudera or Hortonworks. Uh, you know, from Cloudera's perspective, they've got the first mover advantage. Um, clearly, they've got the juice, they've got the, the cash uh, injection from Intel, and they've got a really deep bench. Hortonworks perspective, they have a very disruptive business model. Um, I'm not sure if everybody's you know, familiar with Hortonworks' business model, but essentially, they are giving away their software for free. They don't charge anything, any license revenue, any license fees for their software, simply um, monetizing via subscriptions for support services. And then, of course, they've also got you know, a really deep uh, and extensive partner ecosystem. And of course, likewise, they have a pretty deep bench. I mean, the, if you look at these two companies in terms of the talent from the engineering perspective, and it's, it's very impressive. Um, those would be my two mo most likely candidates in terms of uh, the first billion dollar company. I think kind of a, maybe a, an outlier or a, a dark horse in this race might be somebody could come out of the big data application space. I think that's where really where the value is going to come from from a practitioner perspective is when we start to see more big data applications that are built on top of the infrastructure that we're seeing being built out uh, at the Hadoop layer uh, and, and just above that. So that, that's a possibility as well. Uh, on to the second question. You know, I would say for sure, if we go back a slide, there's going to be consolidation in this market. There's no question about that. There's just too many vendors for, our, for this market to support in the long term. Um, and you know, this is a pattern we've seen in other markets. Uh, this happened in the business intelligence market in the mid-2000s, uh, shortly thereafter in the MPP data warehouse market. Acquisitions, uh, consolidation happened. And I expect it to happen uh, in the big data market as well. Um, and we're already starting to see that with players uh, like Teradata making acquisitions of uh, Think Big Analytics, Adapt, and some others. Uh, so I would expect that to happen. But the question here is, you know, does that, what does that do for some of the industry heavyweights? And my opinion is that some of these acquisitions are going to happen, but I don't think it changes the fundamental economic challenges that the heavyweights have. Um, that is the open source nature of Hadoop and the big data ecosystem that's evolving around it. Um, the, the license modeling is different. Um, it's, a, it's a fundamental uh, challenge to the business model of the industry heavyweights. And simply acquiring the technology, which they potentially could do, uh, does not change that equation. It still is going to require a business model change on the part of the uh, heavyweights uh, to really adapt to this market. OK, so you're thinking about, where do I place my money? We talked about the, the big guys in this market, and they're under pressure, and they're struggling to adapt. We've got the new startup vendors, uh, most of them not public yet. So the question then is, where do I put my money? Put another way, who are going to be the biggest winners in big data? In our opinion, in our thesis, is that the biggest winners in big data are going to be the practitioners. As Dave mentioned, uh, a lot of the credit for our thesis goes to our friend Peter Goldmacher, who really opened our eyes to this idea uh, back in 2010, 2011, uh, when he was talking to us about uh, the ERP market and how that evolved. And if you had tried to pick the winner from a vendor perspective in the ERP market in the early 90s, you never would have picked SAP. But if you had focused on which companies out there are using ERP technology most effectively and put your money on those companies, you would have had quite a, quite a good return. So we've been testing out this thesis. Does this hold up in the big data space? Uh, and we fundamentally think that it does. So we believe that it's going to be companies that leverage the digital fabric, as Dave described, to create new business models, for example. New companies, companies like Uber, like Netflix, notwithstanding their not so great uh, results today, um, into it. They're creating completely new lines of business, new uh, markets, and really disrupting some of the old line uh, industries. Those are the companies that we think are going to be the big winners. Uh, but as well, kind of the more traditional enterprises uh, that you see out there that are making use of this technology to you know, find efficiencies, drive more profits, and open up new lines of business for themselves, sometimes in completely adjacent markets. Um, so we're seeing that from companies, you know, 100-year-old plus companies, Coca-Cola, GE, companies like UPS. So this is not confined, we don't believe, to the web giants and to startups. Um, this is going to impact companies across industries. Now having said all that, 
it's important to, to recognize that in terms of the state of big data in the enterprise, we are still in very early days. So again, this is data from our big data adoption survey. Uh, just lay this out for you. On the left-hand side, you'll see this blue piece of the pie represents the 31% of early adopters who are in production deployments. That means they're supporting production applications with big data infrastructure and software. 28% have a pilot project or a POC underway. And 41% are in the evaluation stage. Now, on, in the gray box, uh, we asked practitioners what tools and technologies are making up, uh, are you using in conjunction with your big data projects? Excuse me. 36% said they're using Hadoop. 38% said they're using NoSQL database of one flavor or another. And again, we think this is really important because these are foundational technologies in this stack. Um, now, another interesting uh, data point I wanted to share, you'll see second from the top, 51%, and that represents the 51% of practitioners who said they're using a conventional data warehouse as part of their big data practice. Um, you know, another question we get a lot from the Wikibon community is, you know, one form or another of the question, you know, is my data warehouse a dinosaur? Now, the answer to that question is yes, but like dinosaurs, it'll be around for another 100 million years, so it, it's going to play a role. Uh, and finally, 52% of the most widely used tools and technologies, data integration tools. Uh, what's interesting here is this, I think, tells a little bit about the complexity of big data technology. It still requires a lot of data movement. Um, but what's interesting that we're seeing shift here is that um, the traditional ETL world is kind of moving from ETL to ELT, uh, where they're loading data into new uh, platforms like Hadoop and using the power of those platforms to do the transformation. So it's disrupting that traditional data integration market. Um, and we're seeing a much more uh, interest in real-time data integration as well, where you're not necessarily moving huge volumes of data, but you've got to move discrete parts, of, uh, discrete volumes of data in real time to point applications, um, and you need to orchestrate that movement uh, in an effective way. So, I mean, one takeaway from this, of course, is this is, this is complicated, this is challenging. And so it's not surprising that practitioners are looking for guidance. So another striking finding in our survey was 72% of practitioners are engaging professional services firms in one form or another uh, to help them either architect, deploy, or run their big data analytics projects. They're looking for help. They're looking for guidance on how to make this work from a technology perspective. They're looking for guidance around what are the best use cases to get started? How do I get a return on my money? And they're looking to outside professional service firms to help them do that. Now, how do you get a return on your money and, and what are practitioners expecting? Well, they're expecting big things. So we asked practitioners if, you, if they could let us know what percent, or I should say, uh, for every dollar spent, how much do they expect to get back in return uh, in their investment in big data technologies? And they're expecting big things in that they're expecting $3.50 return on every dollar invested in big data technologies and services. Unfortunately, the reality today is that they're only getting a return of, on average, 55 cents. So that's a long way from where they want to be, for sure. Now, it's important to remember that this is just a mean. This is just an average. And then, in fact, there are a handful of companies across industries, but a handful of companies that are doing this well and are really um, transforming their businesses and earning quite a profit with big data. But on average, big data practitioners are struggling to get a return on their investment. Now, the reason for that are there are a number of barriers associated with big data. It's complicated, meaning there are data and technology-related challenges. There's challenges around data integrations we talked about. Data transformation is another major challenge we hear about. Getting data just into suitable form so you can analyze it takes up a lot of time and effort. There are people and process issues, and this may even be kind of a bigger, bigger barrier. Things about, around mindset, around you know, what can we do with data? People are so used to being constrained to the, uh, the old model of defining the question in advance and not really being creative with the questions they could ask. And that's changing, and people have to change with that. So there are people in process challenges that they have to overcome. But the most striking finding, in my opinion, in terms of the barriers, was really this misalignment between IT and the business. Now, this is old as the hills. It's not uh, restricted, certainly, to big data, but um, it's certainly rearing its head in this space as well. So we asked practitioners to rate the relative success of their big data projects. Um, so when we asked IT, you know, over 60% felt like they were getting the full value of their investment in big data technology. Sounds pretty good. 60%? Okay. We asked the business 
side of, of the house the same question, and under 20% felt like they were getting the full value of their investment in big data. Now clearly there's a disconnect here. And you know, part of the challenge, I think, is that there are different ways that they're measuring success. IT is looking at standing up systems. Is the Hadoop cluster up and running? You know, are the green lights flashing on the disk drive? OK, great, mission accomplished. The business side is saying, well, you know, we need insights from this data that we can actually use to drive our business. Uh, so they're judging uh, their, the criteria for evaluating success is different. And that disconnect is really, I think, in part leading to that uh, 55 cents on the dollar return that we talked about earlier. So, you know, this is, I kind of laid it out here, a lot of doom and gloom around, you know, the state of big data in the enterprise today, but the reality is we do believe this is going to be transformational. And the reason, among other things, is that practitioners really do believe this is critical to their business. So, you'll see here in the yellow box, we asked practitioners, you know, which of the following best describes your attitude towards big data analytics? Now, this little sli tiny, uh, slice of the pie, this 1%, represents the 1% of people that said big data analytics is a buzzword of unclear meaning. Now, interestingly, we asked the same question around the term cloud uh, back in 2011, I believe it was, and 95% of the practitioners felt cloud was a, a buzzword of unclear meaning. And I'd venture to guess if you asked it today, you'd still get around 50%. So the fact that we're that this far along in big data, and it's just 1% that feel that way, I think says something. And then on the other side of the equation, 46% of practitioners felt that big data analytics is the new source of competitive advantage for their enterprise. On the other side of the page, you'll see in this blue box, this represents uh, a question we asked, you know, what are the major drivers you're looking at in terms of big data projects? Is it to save money? Is it to make money? Neither or both? The majority, 55%, see this as what I would consider a strategic investment. They are looking to both save money and make money with big data. They're not looking at this as a tactical tool to solve a particular discrete problem. They're looking at this as transformational technology that's strategic to their business. And again, just to reiterate, we really do believe that practitioners are gonna create exponentially more value than big data vendors. The other reason we really believe this is that it's already happening. So in this box, you'll see just representing some of the industries that were, that, uh, were part of our survey, um, IT technology providers, but also healthcare, manufacturing, banking, finance, retail, wholesale, and then we've got a big slice of the pie there, other, agriculture, pharmaceutical. So this really does span industries. And as, and as I said, we're already seeing this happening in you know, these new companies that are creating new business models like Uber, like Fitbit, like Netflix, but it's also happening in some of these larger, uh, more uh, traditional enterprises, if you will, Coca-Cola, GE, um, J.P. Morgan Chase, banks or, or in financial services are somewhat ahead of the game in terms of adoption. So this is happening at the web giants, this is happening at new startups, this is happening at uh, more traditional enterprises. But it's important to remember that as, as exciting as this, this is, big data is challenging, and just because a company adopts big data technology does not mean they are gonna be one of the winners. Um, from an investment perspective, you've gotta be very uh, selective about the companies that you invest in um, and it's going to be about who are the practitioners that use this technology uh, most effectively. And one way to look at this is, you know, what's your data IQ? And here are some questions and a kind of a framework that we, we think uh, will help investors kind of ask the right questions and uh, evaluate companies who are starting down this big data journey. And again, it's not specific necessarily to quote unquote big data. It starts with how well are you leveraging the cloud? You know, companies that are adopting the cloud and leaving the kind of non-differentiated heavy IT lifting to others, those are the ones that I think are starting themselves down the right path. How well are you personalizing the, personalizing the user experience? You know, consumers expect a certain level of personalization, and how well, I might add, are you anticipating their needs? And that's also a big data analytics uh, challenge. How secure, private, and trusted are your transactions? Because ultimately, that's what you're trying to get to is a transaction. Um, and we've seen the concerns around privacy, uh, data breaches, and those kind of things. And that's, there's no quicker way to kind of sink your prospects there can, than to suffer a, a major breach. So this is an important part of the equation. How effective are you at fostering information sharing? I mean, this is the collaborative economy. Um, your consumers don't want to just 
Uh, it's not a one-way street between the vendor talking to the consumer. It's the consumer talking back to the vendor, and consumers talking to each other. And if you can foster that information sharing, that's going to help you move on to making those transactions happen. Another important big data question, do you have the data science skills to harness collective intelligence? So we're gathering, organizations are gathering data from multiple sources. It's coming from inside, outside the enterprise. Um, do you have the skills to make sense of all that information, to find the insights, actionable insights that you can act on to actually drive your business? And then, of course, how rapidly can you react to those insights, to the evolving consumer tastes, to new value opportunities as they present themselves, as you identify them through data science? You can't just identify them. You've actually got to be able to put in the infrastructure and the processes to take advantage of those. So this is our framework for evaluating uh, big data practitioners uh, and where we think some of the biggest winners are going to be. So you know, just to kind of wrap up, we talked about the market, traditional market, and the pressure we're seeing on the major vendors. The big data ecosystem is exploding. There's a lot of innovation happening there. But the biggest winners are going to be practitioners. And if you focus on the practitioners that are doing these things well and are laying the foundation to do these things at scale, we think that's the best place to put your money in the big data market. So thank you very much. Um, happy to take any questions if anybody has any. Don't be shy. Well, I think you know one of the challenges. Sure. So uh, the question was, you know, how are organizations tackling the, tr the challenge of kind of getting that single view of the truth and, and um, transforming data into a form that really gives you that single view of the customer, uh, that single view of an entity, whatever it might be. Um, well, I think what's happening, you know, is w on the one hand, you've got big data can serve as a the the larger the data source, the data volume that can iron out some of the discrepancies in data quality, but it's still a really important problem, and I think you know, we're still trying to figure out how to, how to crack that nut. You know, there are vendors out there that are building tools and technologies around data transformations and trying to do that in a way that allows a business user to do it so that they, those with the domain knowledge can, can take action on that. But it's an important area that you know, we still need to see some more development on. I mean, data quality is a challenge that's been with us you know, in the old world, it's gonna be with us in the new world, um, but it's about really connecting the right dots. It's an analytics challenge is what it is. So it's not just thinking about it in terms of data quality, it's thinking about it in terms of analytics. Well, it is true, certainly, that the emerging big data technology, Hadoop, you know, SQL, based on a lot of open source technology, um, you know, and the economics are, are very different than the traditional world. I mean, it's the numbers, as much as 10 times different in terms of pricing around an EDW versus a Hadoop uh, installation with similar amounts of data. So that's one reason. I think there's just going to be, the pie isn't going to be as big in that space, you know, for, for a, a mega vendor to try to replicate the revenue they're getting from their database business with Hadoop, that would be a challenge. And so I think partly that's the reason, but ultimately I think it's because it's, it's the right, I mean it's, it's good news I think for vendors that practitioners are gonna create more value because that's the right market dynamic. If it's the other way around, if the vendors are creating a lot more value than, than, than the practitioners, well that's gonna collapse under its own weight eventually. So um, ultimately we just think when you're putting this technology to work, uh, you just have much more, uh, the ceiling is much higher in terms of the amount of value you can create. Back there. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, so some of the, the question was to kind of expand on some of the people and process challenges that we're seeing the practitioners uh, run up against. Well, there's a few different areas I'd, I'd touch on there. One is around this whole idea of, uh, I guess you might call it, some call it kind of the schema on read. So the idea 
in the old world was you had to kind of model your wares ahead of time. You had to basically ask, know the questions you wanted answers to prior uh, to setting up the system. So you, want, you had to model your data warehouse in such a way that it could answer these predetermined questions. Um, what happened with that is practitioners, business users, uh, were kind of trained not to ask too many questions. It was, you know, let's set this up in advance, and if you have to ask a new question, well, gee, that's going to take three months or six months to get that new data source involved and model that data so you can actually get an answer. Um, and, and I think practitioners were conditioned not to ask more questions because the answer they were often getting from IT was, well, we either we can't do that or it's going to take too long. So now with some of these newer systems, you can ask any question. The idea is to not model the data ahead of time and to ask the question and model the data as it's, uh, as it's read back. So that's a, a kind of a change in mindset in terms of the idea that you can actually ask these questions. You can get these answers. Um, you know, in terms of scaling, you know, part of the challenge is, I think one of the challenges with traditional BI has always been, you know, how do you get it to more people to use it? I mean, the number roughly is around 20% of people in any given organization are using business intelligence. It's never really gone much higher than that in, in the average organization. And part of the reason is, in my opinion, is that it required kind of a separate user environment. People were, uh, you know, if you want to get some insight into your data in this business intelligence tool, you go to a separate BI tool. What I think needs to happen is more integration of analytics and BI into the operational applications that people use every day. Um, I think that's one way you scale analytics and make it truly um, ubiquitous in the organization. Well, I think from, you know, from the, sorry, what, what, what's the uh, difference between the kind of the old world and the new world in terms of the technology? Um, I think what's different, a couple things. I think the three things that are most uh, important to recognize are that the software itself is open source. Now, open source doesn't mean free. It's, I've heard it say, you know, open source is free like a, a new puppy is free. You know, there's a lot of other challenges that go around that, for sure. But that's one dynamic that's different. Um, the hardware component is also very different. In the traditional data warehouse world, it's really built up around kind of the appliance model, the exit data model, um, the Teradata appliance model, where you're bundling really uh, expensive proprietary hardware uh, with the software. And in the new model, it's using commodity hardware scaled out, um, not tied directly to the software. So that dramatically changes the economics. Um, and it also improves the, you know, the, allows you to scale at a, at a rate that you couldn't before, either for economic reasons or for performance-related reasons. So I think those are two areas where there's definitely a difference. Um, you know, there have been, you know, in the kind of high-performance computing space and, and others, there have been, you know, people have been doing big data before this, but it was very expensive. It was supercomputers. Um, I think what's different about big data is it's making it economically feasible for most enterprises to tackle this problem now. Anybody else? Oh. Hey. Mm. Well, so the question was, the, the, the concept of the data lake, is that, uh, has that kind of run its course? It's, um, I guess the premise of the question was that was kind of popular as a concept a couple years ago, and is maybe we're moving away from that. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. I would say that the idea of having a single physical data lake, um, yeah, that idea, I think, is difficult to achieve in reality, um, especially at a large enterprise. So you're seeing large enterprises with Hadoop deployments, for example, across data centers. In some cases, you've even got you know, multiple distributions in use. Um, the interesting thing would be if you can link those in a way to create more of a virtual data lake um, that allows data scientists and analysts to actually access any data within the organization without it needing to be in a single physical cluster. Um, I think that more of a virtualized uh, data lake with kind of a federated view across, that's kind of the model I see uh, kind of going forward. Yep. We have one more. Uh, 
that's a great question. Um, so the question was, you know, what percentage of, uh, you know, what percentage of signal is being generated from all the noise that's happening? That's that's a tough one to answer, and I think it, it certainly varies by industry. Um, you know, I, so I can't give you a, a number on that. What I would say is, you know, in terms of the more successful big data uh, deployments that we've seen, are the ones that start with a business problem and not more IT-led, where, you know, from an IT perspective, they say, well, we're going to create this data lake concept and we're going to load data into it and then maybe we'll figure out some, some signal from all that noise in there. That is a much more challenging problem than if you come at it with a business problem and a hypothesis about what data sources you think are going to be the most valuable and hold the most predictive value. And if you take that approach, you're going to have a much, I'm trying to frame it in the way you asked the question, a much higher percentage of signal to noise than if you were to take a kind of boil the ocean approach. We're just going to throw all this data in here and we'll find a business problem for it later. Um, it would be very interesting to do some research. I suspect that that's one area, one way to look at the problem, and I would imagine it also varies by kind of vertical industry and the particular problem you're trying to solve. So with that, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate your time and attention, and uh, I think I'll welcome Dave Vellante yeah, back to the podium. We're going to do the thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. Nice job. Oh. So plenty of time to ask questions of the panel. So let me now call up the panelists. Jeff, you wouldn't mind helping me with the chairs here. Uh, absolutely. We're on uh, double duty. So let me introduce you to uh, the panel members. So we just need four. So Sorry, Peter Goldmacher, uh, we've been abusing his name. Peter, thanks very much. Good to see you. Uh, former Cowan analyst and uh, sort of expert in this space. Uh, Amy O'Connor. Amy's with Cloudera, so we're going to recuse you, Amy, on a lot of the questions walk. that we're going to be asking and riffing about, but uh, feel free to jump in. Thanks very much for, for coming today. Uh, Amy, uh, former team lead at uh, Nokia, big data team. Uh, and, um, yes. and Abhi Mehta. Thank you. Where are you, Abhi? There he is. A friend and colleague, Abhi Mehta, uh, CEO of Traceda, a really interesting company, doing some cool stuff in the big data space, former practitioner of B of A. Um, well-known speaker. So thank you. Thanks very much for, for joining us. And uh, of course, Jeff Kelly as well. Actually, some of the questions you guys asked are better than ones that I had, so I'm going to start there. And, uh, yeah, why don't we turn that oh, off? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's giving you a nice When's the IPO? <laughs> All right. Uh, give me a second. Great. Thank you. Okay, so uh, again, thank you very much for coming on. I, I actually, I, I love that question about what's really different. I'm going to start with the practitioners. Amy. Okay. What's really different about this whole story? I love this question because this is how I, how I start Help. all my talks with customers. So I am with Cloudera. I've been with Cloudera for a year. Uh, my title is evangelist. It's fairly religious. Um, I travel the world and talk to customers at all sorts of different stages of adoption about what do they need to do to adapt, how do they need to change their orgs, culture, and all that. And when I talk about what's different, I kind of start, I basically say there's seven things that are different between this big data world and the traditional BI and analytics world. And Jeff, you really hit on them. You hit on the first three that I was going to say are, are pretty um, important. Number one, economics. The economics of this is just radically different, so you can store a lot more data. Number two, compute. So in the old world, if you put a whole bunch of data on a big disk, physically you couldn't spin the disk and get it into the CPUs to compute on it fast enough. So it's a distributed file system, but it's distributed compute. So now you can compute on it. And we have all sorts of customers that are doing things in a matter of minutes that used to take them weeks. The third thing is linear scale. And this is something that's going to impact a lot of IT organizations. You can build this thing up by just popping in more of these little commodity servers. So it changes the procurement model drastically. It really means that you don't have to do this buyout way ahead of time of all of this capacity. And, and I always say those three things are the bread and butter. And once you get past the bread and butter, then you get to the differentiators. And there's only four, and I'll hit them quickly. The number one that you also mentioned is this concept of no schema on write. So when you bring the data into the system, you don't change it from however it was created. You take it from, if it came from video, if it came from sensors, if it came from log files, you don't change it. So you don't do any work on it. You just put it in the system. This actually creates an agility that lets people over time to transform it over and over again. It's really, really powerful. And that basically means that um, 
You can start now to do things like real-time um, views of this as well as historical views. We see customers using this for fraud analysis, for geolocation analysis. So there's kind of a lot that's happening in that space. And then it also, because you're kind of bringing all this data together and someone asks the question of, is it still one lake? And we do often see um, the concept of one lake or one hub with maybe some other ancillary ones, depending upon where the data is created. But we do see that because a lot of people want to share their data across these silos. So they're breaking down the silos in their business and sharing data, which leads to the last basic premise of true innovation, the ability to really get at the data very quickly because you don't have to ask IT to go find it. It's just there. Transform it and then find some innovation or fail fast and move on. So Avi, you, you, thank you. That was great. So Avi, you built one of the first data factories you know, in the financial services business. Could you have done it? with uh, existing technologies? Was that like a joke or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so anything else? Any, anything you'd add to, to Amy's yeah. comment? Turn me off and I'll just yell. Yeah, I can yeah. Do yeah, uh, So I think uh, I just have a, I use keywords to, to make the seven points, which is faster, better, cheaper. You know, we've all been in technology long enough and we've all just said that it's impossible to achieve faster, better, cheaper in technology. If you want, you know, if you want uh, two of those, you have to lose one, right? And finally, so if you want better and cheaper, you can't be faster. If you want faster and cheaper, you can't be better. And we finally have all the tools in play, thanks to Moore's Law and no one else, right? Which allows you to get faster, better, cheaper in technology, finally. So that's my you know, three word answer to the what's different. I think the biggest thing that's different is got nothing to do with technology. It is fundamentally customer behavior is different. And as industries, you know, the point that you made, the practitioners would make the most money. Uh, it's very interesting uh, as to how you pick, uh, how we pick our customers to work with, which is um, the segment we, or the term we coined, I think first shared with you, the sampling is dead, right? And what it means technically is that you can actually treat your customers in segments of one. What that means is that uh, just like, and we joke with this with our banking buddies, you know, Trisada's software specializes in financial data, and we say if Google can personalize a search for two billion people, the least we can do is personalize banking for 100 million, you know, personalize retail for three million. And that is what's fundamentally different, that if you have to treat every single customer as their own segment and build products and services as a business that caters to Dave, Amy, Jeff, Peter, Abi, how do you do that with an economic model that can scale? And luckily for us, um, in this Darwinian moment that we are living, we can finally, a business can finally enable an understanding of customer behavior and treat the customers and give them, for every single customer, exactly what they want at their price. I think that's what's fundamentally different. Everything else that we are seeing is the evolution of technology that enables a business to deliver on that promise. I think that fundamentally will drive companies like ours, you know, delivering customer intelligence, Amy's or Peter's new gig, um, uh, to, to, to figure out how can customers be treated with products and services that no one else can build except the smartest practitioners? That is fundamentally different. Well, and that leads us to the, the fundamental premise, Peter, that we first heard from you, uh, that notion of practitioners will make, create more value than, than the suppliers. Um, interesting thought. Uh, you made a lot of noise about the existing old guard, particularly you know, Oracle, SAP, I don't know what you said about Teradata, but I'm just going to throw them in there. <laughs> Nothing good. <laughs> Nothing good. <laughs> and uh, so you were very outspoken about that. And as you joked the other day when we were prepping for this, this panel, you said, yeah, and now I'm out of a job. Have you, have you uh, uh, changed your tune on that? Do you still feel that way? I mean, Oracle threw off $15 billion in free cash flow the last four quarters. Um, now, their stock really wasn't rewarded for it, maybe to your point. Uh, but can't they just gobble up some of these big data guys? Um, so have you rethought that at all, or have you you know, dug in your heels and, uh, and even feel more conviction for that. I wonder if you could talk about that. Yeah, so, um, so I was a sell side analyst at Talon for 10 years and left for a bunch of reasons and went back into industry, worked at Mongo for two months and then realized I didn't really want to have a boss, which in my case meant I didn't really want to have a job. So I'm not working now and I'm thinking deep thoughts. But what, what I have learned- For personal reasons, right? Yeah. Personal reasons. <laughs> Spend more time with my family. <laughs> um, what what I what I have learned, or what I have come to believe, is that um, definitely this is uh, an enormous opportunity for companies. No 
Nobody buys a product saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend $10 on this piece of technology because I only wanna generate $3 in return, right? If I'm spending $10, I need $100 or $1,000. So there's no doubt that uh, if Cloudera sells a billion dollars worth of product, that they're generating $100 billion worth of value for whomever they, uh, whoever their customers are. So what Jeff was talking about and what you, you were alluding to earlier is we ran a study of what happened to all the ERP vendors, uh, all the customers of the ERP vendors in the 90s. And um, what happened was ERP gave these vendors the ability to automate, uh, gave the customers the ability to automate, gave them scale, let them get much bigger. So that automation process created an entirely new kind of company where your R&D spend as a percentage of your revenue declined by a third. Your, your actual revenue growth was uh, up 8x and your market cap grew by 5x. And what you're gonna see now, what I, what I think you'll see is, you know, we've already got a handful of multi, multi-billion dollar big data companies, right? Netflix, um, Facebook, LinkedIn, Goog, and Adobe is arguably now a big data application vendor. So it's happening. We just, we just thought Google was search and we just thought Facebook was like what people use to show pictures of their cats and stuff and LinkedIn is Facebook for adults. Um, but these companies fundamentally could not have existed without this technology. Um, and that's where we are. Well, speaking of the ROI, like Jeff, I saw the numbers. Uh, practitioners expected 350, was it, on every dollar spent? They're not talking to CEOs, if that's the return <laughs> that they're expecting. I mean, Amy, what are you seeing in terms of, of desired ROI and actual ROI? Jeff was saying it's the mean is 55, which is not too good. Every dollar spent, they're getting 55 cents back. But you talk to the guys that, some of the folks that Peter just mentioned, a lot bigger numbers. What, what are you seeing? Well, yeah. Um, so, so I, those numbers were great, and, and I think what we see a lot are numbers that are a little bit lower than that, and that's because of the other chart that you had, which said how early the adoption is. So, in most enterprise customers, and it's not the, the Googles and the Facebooks, the Web 2.0 kind of companies, but the enterprise companies, what we're seeing is that the simplest way for them to adopt this is to pick an operational efficiency use case, some place, maybe it's compliance, so FINRA, for example. They're required to store 15 years of data. 80% of their IT storage costs were, were being, 80% of their IT costs were being spent on storage, so they moved over to, to Clear Data. So we're seeing a lot of folks that either couldn't store or couldn't process their data in traditional environments. So they moved to Hadoop, and those ROI numbers are really easy for them to measure because they're hard and fast. I've reduced my storage costs, or I've reduced my processing time, and therefore I can put that time onto something else. So a lot of people start on that operational efficiency and then at the same time start looking at the things that are going to hit the top line and really cause a basic transformation in the business. So we kind of see it happening, those two things happening in parallel, a little IT driven on one side, creating that environment, getting some of those lower numbers, but enough investment number to actually justify the, what the cost of putting this infrastructure in place. And then the revenue generation, the innovation use cases take a little bit longer. So as folks start to get into those, that's where you're gonna see the, har har the faster and the larger ROI numbers. And did you see that at, at Nokia to the extent that you can talk about that, that kind of you know, larger return? And, and I'm gonna ask the same of you in your sort of previous practitioner world. Yeah, absolutely. So um, some of the things that we did at Nokia when I was first there, so I don't know if we went into that background, but I, I built and ran the big data team at Nokia for three years before I joined Cloudera. So some of the things that we did there was to uh, well basically bring in search files that we weren't using at all, looking at some of the app store that we needed to look at. And so some of that stuff was basically operational efficiency. And then we eventually got into, because Nokia owns Navtech, the mapping property that's in most of the, the cars and the Garmin's. Um, what we got into was, was really building out maps on an automated basis from GPS probes off of the phones. That took two years to get to that point where we could automatically refresh maps on a very quick basis. Um, and that made a major change in the business, not only on the cost side, because to change a map, somebody has to drive a road or go there, but if you can do it from a GPS probe, then you have an automated process. But also, you can get those maps to market more quickly so that you can actually raise your revenue. 
And then there's incremental market um, offers after that, which is traffic patterns. Traffic patterns um, are based on historical traffic models, and then you layer in incidents on top of it. So we all know and suffer with traffic every day of our lives. There's a lot of people out in the world working on traffic, and that was an incremental revenue stream on, on top of some of the basic things. And Avi, what, are you, what are you seeing now? What have you seen in your past, and just in terms of that return on dollar well, invested? I think Nokia and Bank of America are bad examples of innovation with data. They both basically got bankrupt, right, and no. got sold. Mm -hmm. uh, one got sold, and one was technically bankrupt. But no, uh, Nokia bought back their share of Nokia Teams network and then transformed themselves into a new company. And they're owned by after Microsoft. No, no, they're Nokia now. The devices okay. are owned by Microsoft. Yeah, so you got to keep track of yeah, yeah, where yeah, things go. Yeah, so absolutely. Look, re in, reinvention is. Driven. Reinvention is a good thing. Okay. You know, it's Google, a good thing. Ma Google Maps changed how mapping is done, right? And there's a reason why people don't buy GPSs anymore. But besides the point, I think there's an interesting way to think about um, uh, ROI. I think the numbers are very telling, and it's a good thing. I think the issue with the numbers are, are very low right now, you know, looking at, at the market, it's not a return on investment, it's a reduction of investment. And that's the numbers are low. So when, the, when there's an operational use case with big data or Hadoop, you will not get a return on investment, you will reduce your inv existing investment and the numbers will be lower. We have a very good, interesting customer, it's a big bank, we can't name the name, not because I would, wouldn't want love to, you know I'm an open guy, but I can't, I would be sued if I did, uh, which is not a good thing. But they bought our software for payments analytics and they are one of the largest treasury providers in the world. And um, they returned their investment in our software in 30 days by closing one deal. So that's more on the you know, higher side of, but that's a new business process. They actually used data which was, a, which was differentiated in the market to build a product no other bank can build. So the slight um, you know, uh, change in your practitioner numbers that I would like to offer is uh, I think practitioners will win, but it's not gonna be the practitioners who adopt big data, it's gonna be the practitioners who have unique data. If you don't have unique data, you will not have a comparative advantage, no matter how good the tool set. So when you're looking at the players who will be winners in big data, if they have a data asset that isn't unique, no matter how good my software, Amy's software, Peter's research, next software company that he goes to, it doesn't matter because your data asset itself is commodity. The thing you have to remember is data is the new infrastructure. Data is not the new comparative advantage. What you get out of the data is comparative advantage. So the reason why Google has, done, has been so successful is because their online data is unique. And Facebook is because their social data is unique. But what I remind people is, Google knows what you search for. Facebook knows what you like. Amazon knows what you buy. So what is the most interesting piece of data? Banks know exactly how you transact. You know? Nokia GPS knows where you travel. Google knows a lot more than what you just search for. So I think you have to really start thinking about return on investment with properties practitioners who have unique data assets. And that is a hard thing to go eke out. I think if you can find those properties, they will do incredibly well. Because data, again, as I mentioned, is infrastructure. Um, what you get out of it is the competitive advantage. It's interesting you say data is infrastructure. We've, we've talked about this notion of what some people are calling this digital fabric. And the basic concept is that you've got industries vertically and horizontally, you've got whether it's infrastructure as a service, social applications, et cetera. And one of those sort of pipes is data. You're, you're putting forth that data is uh, a, a way to traverse potentially different opportunities. Absolutely. And you're seeing actually, you see Amazon now competing with Google, Absolutely. Apple in media and in healthcare, actually traversing, taking advantage of that di digital fabric. Uh, question. It's a great question, first of all. Yeah, so GE and GE. G, so sorry, yeah. Obviously, but now are looking to use, uh, improve productivity so that they can I increase the uh, revenue by 1%, really is what they're looking for, sure. what you were going to comment. Yeah, I'll, take a, I'll take a crack at it. You know, I'm not very familiar. I'm not a GE business model expert, but uh, the, the big data becomes interesting. We were talking to an interesting company today morning, SyncSort. You know, John uh, is in the, in the audience, and they're in 4,000 companies. And they are a mainframe company. Right? They're 4,000, so I, I mean, the interesting part about that was, outside of the fact that he's a great guy, 
that there are 4,000 companies in the world that still use mainframes, you know, which always shocks me. But the interesting part, the, angle, the point I'm going to make with this is there is a lot of legacy assets that companies like GE have. And I believe, personally, they have a lot of unique data assets. They, are, they probably have the only or single largest source of airline use information through their engines. They probably have the GE appliance, but they recently sold it. So I, I try and keep up with some sales and M&A transactions, not all of them. But they sold the appliance business, and, but they have 30% you know, of the world's appliance data on how you're using your washers and dryers and microwaves. So I, you know, the ability to take a base, be it a bank with 100 billion in revenue, and then find the you know, operational improvement or revenue improvement, these are big numbers. 1% on 100 billion is 10 billion. And you can use unique data assets to hopefully get there. How, whether it's cost saves or revenue, I think I'm assuming the G1 was more cost save driven. G is expert at cutting, cutting costs out. We don't see yet, this is us, Trisada, as an intelligent software company, we see very few customers talking return on investment. We see a lot of customers talking reduction on investment. Uh, but I think it's going to change. I think it's, this is a, a tough item to grasp. The bank we worked with was interesting because they realized that their payments business was unique. They have 50% market share, and no one else has that. And they had visibility in the world economy like no one else does. If you have that foresight, I would buy that stock. <laughs> you know, if I am an investor, I want to buy that stock. Because they're thinking, they're taking a dynamic approach to changing the business model. Versus saying, I'll save $50 billion in cost, which is interesting, but you know, not, it's not a market we play in. Yeah, that opportunity for business is, is really important because um, if GE, for example, is able to reduce processing time somewhere, make more efficiencies, reduce those costs, that means that they can reinvest in other areas. So we really do see both sides of the coin. And I've worked with, in just in one year, over 200 customers that are at various stages of this big, big data adoption. We see both sides of the equation in every account. Yeah, I, I would just echo that. I mean, if you, if you think about some of these early use cases around finding the right data point, I mean, they really spent this much. Net users spent this or ROI on some of the large storage efficiencies. We spent this much last year, and now we're only spending this much this year. But if you can then take those, that, that those savings and pump that back into new, uh, you know, new investments in big data and analytics. Um, that's one way to kind of get the flywheel moving. Yeah, and Finra, for example, it's ten to twenty million dollars a year they're going to save by just moving their storage into the Hadoop environment. Mm -hmm. So now they're doing better fraud analysis. Right. So you're seeing a similar sort of reduction on investment emphasis today. You know, I, I when I talk to these folks, we're just talking about the big data side. We don't drag into the rest of their budget. I want to just talk about like the, what's the new and exciting stuff we're going to do. So we'll we'll let you guys go and do <laughs> the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go ahead, Jeff. You want to go? Um, <laughs> no, I was just you know, it certainly it makes sense. To, that's where you're going to start. But I think um, it would be a mistake to look at Hadoop as just a low cost storage environment yeah. because then you're missing a huge part of the value proposition. Um, yeah, and that's kind of where you that you might call that a lake. Is it just going to sit there in a lake? Mm -hmm. And that's not what you want. Right, you want to bring the data together so that you're going to do something to it, you, to your point. Yeah, and I, I mean, I would say based on you know, the conversations we've had over the last, I, I mean, I, I see it changing the last six months. Um, I think it started in Hadoop Summit, and a lot of the conversations we had in the Cube here today, we start, what do we talk about today on the Cube? Machine learning, um, analytics. So we're, talk, we're moving up the stack slowly, up to actually making use of all this data that we're, people are collecting in the, in the so-called data lake. Um, and that's an important step, but Really, a lot of it does start with those efficiency findings. So, Peter, we were talking about your scenario of practitioners and value and all that stuff, and that was sort of the first part of the question. The other part was sort of what happens to the existing guys, the guys that you, you know, didn't have many good things to say about. Um, you know, we're kind of always looking when these waves come along for new players, new billion-dollar companies to emerge, and, and, and the old guard getting, getting crushed. Although a lot of these companies did the crushing back in the client-server days. Um, with so much cash and the ability to sort of like, we were at Oracle Open World a couple weeks ago, everything was cloud, you remember? 8i and 9i, that was internet. And, and then 10g and 11g, that was grid. And then grid turned into the cloud, so there was 12c. So you, but basically, you know, Oracle, Larry Ellison, they act like they, they, they invented it, right? They just wait and wait and wait, buy a company, spend money. Is that not sustainable? Uh, what's your what's your outlook for these large enterprise software whales? So I th I think that um, something very bad is happening in the startup world, and and it's 
the, the Intel investment in Cloudera really crystallized it for me. You have Intel saying we have a arguably a hundred million dollar company that we think is worth about four billion dollars. So Tom and Mike say, fuck, four billion dollars? <laughs> we need to sell a ton of stuff. <laughs> so so they have a big problem, right? So they have all this money and the the they're not gonna take that money and and make a lot of really compelling technology buys or do something great with the product. They'll do little stuff around around the edges. They've got an enormous go-to-market effort. So what they're saying is we're gonna build our differentiation through distribution. So if we generate a hundred million dollars in revenue, has that hundred million dollars cost hundred and fifty million dollars to generate two hundred, two hundred and fifty million dollars? So revenue growth is only a component of the story. It's not really the most interesting part. The most interesting part is when are you going to make money? So we see Mongo raising $250 million. Now Datastax has raised 250 and Cutter has raised about a billion. I mean, the amount of money behind these companies is enormous. And none of the capital efficiency. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, look, you've got Salesforce.com that does $5 billion in sales, doesn't make money, and has a $35 billion market cap. So nobody gives a shit about making money anymore. They just want to get big. So, so Cutter says, well, look, we're, we're bigger than Hortonworks because we've got 100 field sales reps, they have 75 field sales reps, so we're doing better than they are. Cisco has 20,000 field reps. Oracle has 35,000 field reps. If, Oracle, if and when Oracle comes in and buys one of these distros and gives it the Oracle glow, which is, look, sure you hate us, we don't care because you pay us every year more than you paid us last year, which is the case for 95% of their customers. If you're not the company that got bought, all of a sudden your differentiation through distribution is gone. Because I don't care if you have 100 reps and, 70, and Hortonworks has 75, because if Oracle buys Hortonworks, now they've got 25,000. They've got their place in a broad data architecture that already exists. So um, no, I don't, think, I don't think the legacy guys are dead. I think the legacy guys are doing what they do, which is let's see how this sorts out a little bit, and then we'll make our move. And I, I, I think, unfortunately, it's going to be a very bad outcome for most of these investments in, in, these, in these technologies. So the rich get richer un until maybe they screw up. Maybe they don't. Well, I think a couple things about the Intel Oh, I, you want to weigh in? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'd like I'm to weigh in on the Intel investment. Yeah. Yeah. It, was a, it was a nice amount of money. Um, it didn't line my pockets personally, so it was a nice amount of Sorry, money. Yeah. And yeah, one of the first things that we did with Your it was... jewelry is beautiful. <laughs> It's all fake. <laughs> um, so one of the first things that we did with it was to acquire a company called Gazang because a piece of our portfolio that was missing was encryption. Um, when, um, and so we acquired Gazang. We're integrating the encryption, which is vitally important, particularly in the financial services arena and retail, anybody, healthcare, anybody that has um, personally identified information. And we're integrating into our product. But the other interesting things that are happening is that Intel stopped doing their own distribution so they're going to redistribute um, Cloudera, and we kind of took the intellectual op IP from that and are putting it back into Apache. And then I think the third thing is that Intel, you know, they kind of in the late 90s said Linux is coming, and they did a major investment in Red Hat to change their chips because they really want to have the footprint in the data center to run Linux. Then they saw the major shift to virtualization. They made a major investment in VMware. So this is what Intel does. This is how Intel takes a step ahead in the market to ensure that they have that strong footprint in the data center. I thought, so uh, is, has Intel, Jeff, anointed Cloudera as the red hat of Hadoop? <laughs> uh, I don't know if I'd go that far. I mean, I mean it's an interesting play uh, from Intel. Um, I think at the time, we, you know, we're, the, the numbers were staggering, for sure. Um, you know, I think it does fit to some extent with their Internet of Things play. Uh, it makes some sense there. But you know, I don't think that means no. I don't, I don't think Cloudera is necessarily the red hat of Hadoop, it's still. Is there a red hat of Hadoop? Well, you know, there are some differences between, you know, the environment uh, when Red Hat was emerging and, and what's happening now. Red Hat didn't have a lot of competition, whereas clearly there's a lot of competition in this market now. Um, so I, I don't know if that's the right way to frame the question. You guys have an opinion on that? Or? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the way in. <laughs> you know, I think it's, um, so uh, I'll, I'll take 
uh, I'll answer your, if, I, if I may, I'll talk about the Intel investment from being a smaller part of the ecosystem. We sit higher up in the stack. All of our software runs in Hadoop. And we, you know, as we said, we deliver customer intelligence. I think from a player in the stack and already the emergent big data world, the Intel announcement was phenomenal. Because I think it has emboldened one player in the ecosystem to go hard. You've heard me say since day one, since five years ago, that Hadoop is bigger than Linux or any other open source wave combined, many times over. Because it goes after the fundamental building block for enterprises in the new, I call it the second industrial revolution, seven years ago, which is data will fundamentally transform business models. If that is true, it is awesome for companies like ourselves to have a player like Cloudera go out and say, finally, this is not complementary. The enterprise data hub you know, will take away business from the data warehouse that the large players sell. That conversation needs to happen. Uh, unfortunately, not all, uh, we were tired sitting there as a player saying, this is not complementary. It is truly disruptive. I think disruption is the wrong word. This is Darwinian. We are rebuilding the technology stack. IT is a $3 trillion market. It's the only place I disagree with your analysis. Maybe you'll do another one, Jeff, because you're so good at analysis. IT is a $3 trillion market. 80% is enterprise software. $2.4 trillion, every single dollar is up for grabs. Every single one of it in the old stack. And there'll be multiple billion, billion dollar, multiple hundred billion dollar companies built off of it. I agree with Peter that I don't think the existing, we, we're not, it's not time to put the nail in the coffin of um, the big players. I, I joke and say you should pick a big tech player if has a good M&A team. I don't think there'll be a red hat. To answer the, I don't think there will be a red hat for Hadoop. I think Hadoop provides such an interesting building block to architect what we call customer intelligence management software. I actually do believe and agree with Peter that you will see some interesting acquisition M&A activity. Because can we, I hope, and I hope my friends in the analyst committee agree with me, can you find people in the stock market, and I know people in the stock market have a different um, intelligence level and they'll buy a lot of things, but Tableau uh, has a $4.5 billion market cap uh, on $80 million of, I think, quarterly revenues now. And Cloudera had an investment at $4.2 billion with nowhere close to Tableau's revenues. Is it frothy or not is not my, my opinion, but I hope the investors are smart enough to realize that market caps des deserve some fundamentals at the back. And um, I don't see you, I think it's very difficult to build a multi-billion dollar enterprise uh, open source software company. And one's been built, and I think we won't see many more. Well, you're making a case for staying private right there. Um, Peter, when I said the rich get richer, you started to sort of say, well, wait a minute. Um, do you disagree with that, or? No, the rich always get richer. Uh, there you go. So, Enterprise software world, they continue to bump along. You know, More consolidation? It's what we've pre selected ourselves to be at Hadoop World and kind of get involved in this echo chamber that's all these guys saying how great everything is and all the opportunity. And, and I believe that's all true. I think time horizons and rate of adoptions are being massively compressed. I think the reality is. Um, it's going to happen much more slowly than people think. So you have, um, so I live in Silicon Valley, and that place thrives on innovation, right? And people are always experimenting. Um, and then I come to New York far too often, and there's some innovation here, not, not to the extent of the valley. But there are all these other states I fly over that don't give a shit about Hadoop or any of this stuff, right? They're just... I mean, there's exceptions. There's John Deere, and there's guys along the way. But when you talk to these customers and you ask them what they're up to, they're like, you know, we're fine. We'll wait. And you have um, waves of adoption. And you're not going to really get into the bell curve of adoption for a long time. And you're not going to get until that bell, into that bell curve of adoption until the, the technology is really vouched for, vetted. Um, people don't perceive the risk. Somebody can go to anybody that's buying anything from Cloudera is also ha having to talk to 15 other vendors for who's your production database and what are we doing for analytics and what are we doing for all these other accompanying technologies. And when whomever it is says, we have, we have enough pieces of the architecture that you don't need to talk to seven other vendors, we have all of that, then, then we really start to see things go mainstream. So. Um, it's a lot of fun to be in the echo chamber, and we all feel great about it. But your number of 
500 million in revenue for 2012 in big data software. Probably came at the expense of about a billion dollars in spend, right? So if I'm selling dimes for a nickel, hopefully I should have a good business. Until we see these companies get profitable, and, and this isn't just big data, this is all these cloud guys, this is, this is Tableau, and until we see the market really start pulling stuff into the market, which I associate with profitability, we're not, we're not there yet. And again, if, if all these startups are spending all their money on distribution and cramming stuff into the market, they're accelerating the eventual trough of disillusionment, which is gonna happen. Uh, then the assets are available for a lot cheaper than they were when Intel thought Cutter was worth four billion. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, and, and, then, and then we can sort of get on with it. I think I would like to add something, because I agree with, uh, and this is very rare. I'm on a panel, but I have not used the F word or the, or the S word, and you have, which is very good. Or the F word. Uh, or the F or the S word, yeah, which is awesome. Uh, that's, uh, I appreciate it. I think customers don't get a shit if you have Hadoop in the back end, because I can do it now. He's used it already. So the, 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 the thing has been set now. You can't. You're about to go public, so you can. You have to behave. Um, I don't have to go public for a while. But um, the, they don't care if you have Hadoop. If you actually have a, so a piece of software that can make you money, I can promise you the business guy will not ask you what's in the back end. Um, and I think we will reach a sense of maturity when the entire ecosystem reaches that, that, that level, right? When people stop asking you. So do you do it on Hadoop? And we're not there yet. But um, look, I do believe this is a massive market. I think Clara is worth multi-billions. Whether they go IPO, whether they go private, doesn't matter. Um, the telling thing for me is more about the ecosystem. Eh? And it's, uh, it's telling because we're part of it. But you go to a partner summit, um, well, it can go unnamed, and you have two customer success stories. And you ask the, the customer the question, which is, what else do you use outside the distro? And this is full of partners, right? And they say nothing. And that's a problem, right? Because unless that, that partner ecosystem matures, all these numbers are moot. Because yes, you'll have three distribution companies, $100 million in revenues. What, what about everybody else? Um, and uh, that's when it becomes interesting is when the ecosystem is developing a, a healthy ecosystem when we are partnering together and you're launching multiple $100 million companies, not just in the distribution layer, when that picture looks different. And I agree with Peter, I think it'll take time. I think there are trailblazers like us there, but uh, it takes time. You know, there, is, there is no partnering in the Hadoop ecosystem. I can assure you of that. There is big players working with the new players saying, we connect to it, so we are Hadoop ready. It's become like the new dot com, it's the dot big data. So you put it behind everything and you're big data ready. Um, but the, uh, but the, the smaller players get no support from the people with the billions. We're building a company the fun way, right? We're profitable, we're paying taxes this year. We have raised zero in, uh, institution money, but then it allows us to be disruptive. Um, but I think unless this ecosystem learns how to partner better, to your original question, how do you get there? If, it is, if this is truly, if you all buy this is Darwinian, whatever word you want to use, and truly multi-billion, we have to prove to each other, all of, all of us as an ecosystem, we can you know, ride in this together. We don't do that. None of us do. So you two really want to talk about Cloudera. I want to bring the conversation back to the practitioners. Um, and, and I do agree with you, Peter. I see waves of adoption of this big data clearly started in Silicon Valley, moved to Washington, D.C., and New York. And then I have to tell you, maybe you get to fly over the middle of the country. I've spent a lot of time in the middle of the country with you know, companies that make the food that we eat, the food that gets grown, the big moving equipment that, that, that moves, and the oil and gas, um, health care all over the place. A lot of the conversations are just starting but they're really interesting conversations. And I also agree with you on the differentiated data conversation I have with every single customer. So there may be things that you can do that are low-hanging fruit that just kind of fix things in your business, but always try to figure out what data do you have or what data can you create that's different from everyone else. And I'll have to tell you, every single business that I've talked to, once you get them really cranking up here, they can think of some data that they have or can create. Whether they're in retail, the retail, we talk about creating a gamified experience across the brick and mortar and the app on the phone and um, you know, the, the presence on the internet and really starting to think about things more like being a casino. With healthcare, we talk about you, what, where's this data that you've created? The videos between the patient and the doctor that have some really vital information. Um, device manufacturing companies 
that they go to trial to try to get the device out, and the FDA at the end says, you have a number of successful trials. But along the way, all of a sudden they realize, we could actually look at what happens in a trial and come up with a better care path for how a doctor should be using that new piece of medical equipment. So it is really early, totally agree with all of you that it's really early, but the conversations are exciting, and I do think the value, the highest value here is that the people who are really thinking about data in new ways are gonna transform our lives. I mean, we all wanna transform what happens to us in healthcare. We all want traffic to be fixed somehow so that we know where to go um, when we leave work at night. We all want all of those things fixed, and they can all be fixed by data. But yeah, Peter, it's gonna take a while, absolutely. We talk about you because we love you. That's, there's yeah, no yeah, reason yeah. Oh. <laughs> So, a lot of brain power, and so I feel smarter just hanging out with you guys. Um, questions from the audience? Um, privacy and security is a huge issue. Um, there's a delicate balance between convenience in our lives and the use of data that we produce in order to create that convenience. Um, I think it's going to change legislatively multiple times over the next decade, so we're all going to have to kind of keep in front of it. Um, I firmly believe that privacy has to be, the privacy policy has to be attached to how the data is used, not how it's created, but that makes for a much more difficult way to process data, which is what one of the reasons why there's more cost. I think it was your top line, which was 52% of the effort was being put in data transformation. So we've, we've built a number of new things. You know, I mentioned we acquired Gazang. We built a new um, a Hadoop component called Sentry, which does better access control. Um, Intel's gonna push the encryption down into the chip. So there's a lot of things out there, but there needs to be a lot more people processes around data governance around all of that. We have to make sure we're differentiating between privacy and security. Sure. So security is, you should not have this data, you can't get at this data. I don't want my social security or my credit card numbers available on the internet. Privacy is, um, can somebody see what I'm doing on the right. internet? And privacy, great fodder for the media, I promise you we don't give a shit about privacy. Raise your hands if you're on LinkedIn. Everybody's on LinkedIn. You don't care about privacy. Facebook, you don't care about privacy. Do you use Google Chrome? You don't care about privacy. We, 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 we sacrifice privacy for convenience every single day. We love to bitch about it, but it's inconvenient to care about privacy, so we don't care. Yeah, so I, my angle would be slightly different on both the two. I agree with you, you should separate the two. I think like any new innovation, data privacy as an issue for society uh, has not caught up with the innovation, and it will take decades to catch up. Uh, we don't even know what it would look like in the future. I do agree with everything you just said, by the way. It, you know, uh, that's number one. Number two, um, there is a very smart gentleman. He advises us, and he built this thing called the New Deal on Data to take privacy head on. It's now been accepted by the World Economic Forum. So our uh, policy on data privacy for our customers is we don't own the data. We put data back into their HDFS environments. They always own it. And we don't give out, we don't software copy, right? We don't really give access to it. Security, I mean, Amy addressed properly. I think the most important part of privacy, uh, which is exactly what you said, is I think people are willing to give a lot, of, a lot up for something free. Uh, so Eric Schmidt said, if you, want, if you don't want me to track you on your, so my search engine, start paying me you know, a penny for every Google search. I won't track you. I've got to make money somehow, right? So when people are willing to get something back in return for giving something up, that's, the, in our opinion, the ultimate answer, because now you've incented people, you've told people up front. So if, for exa an example I use is, do you have a, you have a iPhone or a smartphone? And which, which company? AT&T doesn't matter, right? When you bought that iPhone or the smartphone, every single telco makes a sign of disclosure that they can track your GPS wherever you go, whether you use your phone or not, doesn't matter. And if they told you that up front and said, you can sign this and it'll give you everything for free, free service, free monthly, some people will say yes, and some will say no. Or if you can, then you can pay us a lot of money, and we won't track you. That conversation has to change, because if there's value in exchange, then you know what you're giving up. It's Unfortunately, it's not transparent right now. That's the problem. Exactly. And it's not, exactly. The other challenge here, and it's, it's not just privacy, but, but you know, the, the model is you, you opt in or you opt out. 
and you know you can the provider can use your data in a certain way. Now, what big data allows you to do is to and, and the value proposition is to find new uses for that data. So that that creates a challenge as, as the as the vendor, as the as the person, uh, the company doing creating the insight is, do I have to go back to the customer every time to get their permission to do a new type of analytics to try to find a new insight? And then, you know, the other thing is the old model, the more rigid enterprise data warehouse model, where you modeled everything ahead of time. You could build that governance into the model. You can only do certain things w with that warehouse. It's built that way. You can only ask certain questions, and you can build that in. With the new model, the schema on read, you're asking questions that you don't predetermined. So does that, so you, you, you could run up against situations where you're asking questions that run afoul of compliance regulations. So how do you, and I don't think we as an industry have figured out at all how we're going to handle that problem. Yeah, it's industry and it's also government. So we see a, a lot of people talking about legislation that may happen in this case instead of having that big, huge privacy policy that you sign up front, mm -hmm. that it would be more use case based. And that's kind of why I talked about the security components of it. You have to secure the data in the system and to be able to audit Absolutely. the data in the system to ensure that you actually have implemented the right privacy okay. policies. May I ask a question? Uh, you know, there was a thought as, as you were answering it, Jeff, but don't you believe that, Jeff, in that case, and we say this to our banking colleagues a lot, that industries that are extremely good at working with regulations, like privacy, like compliance, it actually could be an advantage for them, a competitive advantage that as privacy does catch up, because it will, right, whether we like it or not, the government is going to be in our business. Um, and, you know, that's the price of living in a lawful society. Don't you think uh, that industries that are adept at running in a regulated environment have a unique advantage as data privacy you know, becomes a commercial concept? Uh, I think that's an interesting point. I mean, certainly, if, you, if, if the flip side of that is you were not adept at it and you yeah. continually run afoul of regulations, well, that's going to that's gonna be a problem. Right. Um, but it's also even non-regulated industries where it's maybe you're not running afoul of a, of a regulation, but if you're doing something that's deemed unethical and you're on the front page of the New York Times because you, yeah. you're targeted and you figured out you know, that your, a 15-year-old customer is pregnant before the, the father did, it's like, well, oh, geez, should we be doing that? I don't even know if that story is true, by the way. I, I get it was a true story. I, I think it's true, but... Uh, I think what hurt them more was the data breach. The security well, part hurt them more. But, <laughs> well, yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, that's, very good. That's, a, that's a very good point. But, you know, so there are, but yeah. beyond security regulation... Yeah, beyond regulation, <laughs> you know, there are certain you shouldn't just because you can do something with big data doesn't mean you should do it, whether there's a law banning it or not. You know, it's a very good point. Uh, there's a phenomenal gentleman. He wrote a book, uh, Philip Evans. I don't know if you ever heard his TED Talk. It's a must listen to. And he argues that the cost of continuing to run data as infrastructure is going to go so close to zero that the marginal cost of adding a product or service, so when uh, the economics, right? When the marginal cost of adding a product or service um, is zero. So an, an incremental search on Google costs Google nothing and they can afford to sell an ad for a penny, it's all profit, right? So I would not give the answer, I would take Philip, I'll default to Philip, he's a good friend of ours, and say, yes, I think the, uh, the economics of managing this unique asset called data have become so commoditized that, you, that every industry where the marginal cost of an additional unit of product or service, if you don't have a platform where that's zero, you'll be out of business. So I think it's an excellent point, and I think that's an interesting dimension on who do you, how do you pick the winners, which is have they built platforms that can scale without adding more cost when they add more customers. So if you have to spend more money to add 100 more customers, you, you don't have a marginal cost of zero, and it's a problem. So I think I do believe that Moore's law and whatever other law we create, Cloudera's law, whatever other cloud maybe, and I say it with, with, with uh, respect, Whatever laws we create. As opposed to the prior comments. Uh, <laughs> because you didn't like them. I, I love you guys. You don't like me. I don't know why. But uh, uh, Nokia is a great company, you know. Uh, but uh, I, think, I think it is here to stay. And uh, we will see tremendous opportunity with it. Another question.
every market of dream and my nightmare. And if that would happen, I would be worried, you know. Uh, yeah, I think the question was, how far are we from this future where the Internet of Things, where places, people, and objects, when they're all uh, uh, connected and uh, spewing data, why, do we, why even search? You should know me, uh, I think I'm paraphrasing, you should know what I'm looking for. Even before Eric Schmidt's concept of Google's vision is, I think the same thing that you said, which is we, will, you, we should give you the information before you search for it. And how far are we from that? Well, that was the question. Right? So I, I think it's definitely going to take time. I was talking to a retailer yesterday, and just to put the RFID tags in all of the different clothing, there's a cost to it. So they've got to look at their model and make sure that it, they're going to get some sort of return on it. But I, I would have to say, in every industry, we are seeing sensors. So mm -hmm. the railways, every travel industry, entertainment, um, retail stores, um, healthcare is huge. So Kaiser Permanente is starting to do a lot of work to help to heal people in their homes so that they can gather information about people and their health in their homes so that they don't have to go to a doctor's office or hospital where you're likely to contract some, something else because of the people that are ill there. So we're really seeing those um, sensors showing up everywhere, but it's, gonna, it's really going to take a while. We have time for one more question. It better be a good one. If not, okay. I want to thank Peter, thank Abby, Amy, Jeff. Really great, great panel. Thank you very much. Okay, now, um, as I think you know, don't leave if you don't have to. Um, we are celebrating five years of the Cube at Hadoop World. Uh, the first year I met you, 2010. And uh, so out, out of here, we got drinks, we got tons of food. So, uh, so please stay, and thanks very much for coming today. If you guys, uh, Jeff's going to have his slides up on SlideShare, and we'll email them out to everybody. So again, thank you for coming, and please hang out and have a drink and some food. All right. Great job.